You're listening to The Great Simplification with Nate Hagens. That's me. On this show, we try to explore and simplify what's happening with energy, the economy, the environment, and our society. Together with scientists, experts, and leaders, this show is about understanding the bird's eye view of how everything fits together, where we go from here, and what we can do about it as a society and as individuals. This week, we welcome Sebastian Heitman from Berlin, Germany, to the podcast. Sebastian is a venture capitalist focusing on tech inventions that, if successful, could result in large-scale reductions in the CO2 emissions for global society. Sebastian and I talk about some of those ideas, in particular, the challenges and opportunities with deep geothermal technology, but we also unpack the energy situation unfolding in his country and the broader backdrop we find ourselves in with respect to energy, technology, and growth. This was a very informative conversation. Please welcome Sebastian Heitman. Guten Abend, Sebastian. <laughs> Guten Abend, Nate. For 25 years, I've been saying Guten Naben because my dad had one semester of German in college and I've learned like 20 German words, but they're all wrong. So thank you for correcting me in our email thread that it's Abend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Guten Abend is the slang version of it. So it, it, it's totally fine. Oh, is it? Okay. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it'll fly by. People will understand you. <laughs> so great to see you last month. We uh, spent three or four hours talking about some of the things we're going to talk about today and that probably could have gone 10 hours. So briefly, if you could just introduce yourself. What is your main work? What is your worldview given that we're alive in the early 21st century? And, and can you share your path of how you landed here working on the things you are? Pleasure. Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me. I remember our conversation very vividly and uh, it left a lot of thoughts in my mind. And I guess this is how we connected and yeah, we've exchanged some materials in the meantime. It was very interesting. Uh, it's stuff actually that... Yeah, it's very close to what I do. So I'm, I'm Sebastian. I'm a co-founder of Extension Capital. We are a climate first venture, basically investing into decarbonization. To get here was not a very straight journey. And I always say the last thing I wanted to do in my life was create a financial product. But here we go. I ended up doing one. My original background is economist and I've worked in, in software and as an entrepreneur. And I've also worked in other fields. But I've had since a long time a sort of a keen interest in the energy space. Huh? And I've also been investing into the space for, for quite a while. Quite a while is like goes back to like 2006, roughly, yeah, when some of you might remember there was a big solar boom. Yeah? All of a sudden, we, we thought that solar becomes scalable, solar will become affordable. And a lot of the solar companies popped out and IPO'd and in the US as well as in Germany until we all learned that yes, solar scales, but not in the Western Hemisphere and mostly in China. And all these companies ended up going bust yeah, because the value add wasn't as significant. And we simply end up being a commodity as it is today. So uh, those were the early days that sort of sparked my interest uh, and ever since I've remained interested in the topic and following 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, I thought, hey, look at this. We finally have a very interesting macroeconomic model that should bring out innovation in climate and started to look for some companies that I thought would be uh, winners yeah? in, in a variety of different technologies, not just one. Picked some companies, invested some own money as well. And so there was a high level of conviction that this will be something. We're now in the year sort of 2016, 17, 18, roughly. Yeah? But the conviction was soon met by frustration, by frustration that there actually 
isn't much capital for innovators in this space. At least wasn't back then. So the mixture of conviction, frustration led to the fact, okay, something's going to do something about it. We can't just all sit and complain. The things we can do on an individual level have very minuscule effects. So let's see if we can change something. And the one thing that we saw that we could change lacking a better idea, I always say, to actually be a founder of myself in the space. I created with the two other partners, Jan Carlos Kunze and Yaya Rem. Um, we created Extancia as a European-focused venture firm focusing on decarbonization. We set out initially with one pilot fund, which we have done investing by now and investing now out of fund number two, sort of which is a larger 10 plus two fund. So that was the journey. In the meantime, now sort of the wave has broken. Yeah. It's now called climate tech, no longer clean tech. It's a bit broader as well. And we see still early, but we still we see some capital flowing into the space. And kind of this was probably our hope yeah, that pioneering in this space, we pave the way to mobilize institutional or private capital into climate because we thought this is the only way we'll stand a chance yeah, of making a significant dent. So that's sort of the journey. In your materials, you mentioned the word gigacorn. Can you uh, explain what you mean by that? Yeah, obviously we asked ourselves what is significant reduction in, in CO2 and we, we broke it down to CO2. We know that there's more than just CO2 to the world, but it's a significant measure that most people can relate to today. Yeah, that's where we say. And, and trying to make it also simple for potential investors. We, we try to be fairly transparent and measurable. Yeah, that's where we're breaking it down to CO2 mostly. So gigacorn is just a term that signifies two things. A, that climate can be, I mean, before we need, we need scale yeah and gigacorns for us are companies that are solving a gigaton co2 problem so we emit roughly 50 something gigatons of co2 per year so any space that contributes at least one gigaton is worth investing in as an industry as a sector as a subsector or whatever yeah? and we then go went on for, okay we can't assume that one company would have 100 percent market share in, in so but 10 percent market share is, is a realistic goal for a company solving a gigaton problem so that's our scale that we say minimum threshold is 100 megatons of co2 that's a lot yeah this is equals the emission of many smaller European countries like Switzerland or something. Yeah, it's a lot. How many gigatons does the whole world use now, emit? 50-something, um, depends on whose measurement you want to yeah. trust. 51, 55, depends, some different numbers, but rough, I think roughly 50, increasing year by year as well. We're not, we're not there yet where we decrease. So yeah, we're currently about 50. The US is roughly three. Yeah, to put that into perspective. So even out of U.S. emissions, it's still a significant um, share yeah? uh, where you can say, does this move the needle? Yeah, And yes, I mean, we're not investing to one company. We're investing into a portfolio of 30 companies. If each of them would be to 100 megaton, we would equalize the U.S. emissions. And a lot of the companies that we invest in have a much, much larger potential there. Uh, there, there can Some of them can do several gigatons of potentially CO2 reduction. Yeah? Well, we can talk about that a bit later in more detail, but um, what type of technologies are most promising. But this is a general thesis on scale. Yeah? So we, we need scale. And the other part is all about um, speed. We call this concept the time value of carbon, lending it from a classic economic principle and our thesis goes that um, a ton abated or removed today is a lot worth has a lot higher value than if this happens in the year 2040 or 50 so this leads you straight away into investing into near-term gains or near-term effects which leads you straight away also to investing mostly into some type of assets or existing infrastructure that don't require long buildup. Uh, something where you can change something that's already existing and decarbonize it. Most of the time, if, you, if you're looking into building up entire new industries or entire new skill sets, it that tends to take a lot more time. Classic example would be fusion reactors. I think very efficient, but it just takes a very long time to build up. And um, from a climate perspective, too late. I think we should still work on it. It's an important topic for the future in general, but we don't have time to see the first reactor come 
online in the year 2040 or 30 or whenever it is yeah for one to come online yeah um, this is this is, does not provide enough speed you're talking about nuclear fusion yeah nuclear fusion yeah for example there's many other technologies too but it's one sort of that most of us would agree is not going to be available in the next two years or next five yeah. ten years at at scale i mean you see you might might see first sort of smaller reactors coming out and test reactors but where we say we can actually produce gigawatts of energy with nuclear fusion i i think it's still a while away so that's the giga part yeah the, that's the giga part the corn part is, is is the pure logic behind it unicorns are you know a common term and we say any company that's able to reduce 100 megatons of co2 just by the logic of the carbon price alone but also by any other logics that we'll see in the market of dynamics is going to be extremely valuable company or you could say the reduction potential the co2 reduction potential of a company serves as a pretty good proxy for future valuations uh, and, and that's why we say these companies will be extremely valuable that's why we always say also climate can be really good business you know, it doesn't have to be only for uh, philanthropy or or concerned environmentalists or something we see a trillion dollar opportunity most likely to be uh, significantly larger than the digitalization that we've experienced over the last two, three decades and companies that were where companies such as Apple or Amazon came out of, uh, there's a very good likelihood that we'll see a lot of those companies coming out of climate that significantly uh, will see extremely valuable companies. You know? mm. So it doesn't have to be, not at all. We actually see that there is a definite economic opportunity as well. But unicorns are also make-believe. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, they they often make believe, and also you, you see sometimes so called climate tech companies who are are not fulfilling the promise. That's mm. always out there. Tesla is an example, extremely high value um, for sure, a pioneer and a great company in paving way to electrification of transportation. But itself, the company's the footprint will will not be very large. Yeah, you could probably attribute some significant enabling factors to them but the co2 reduction is not the main driver of value here yeah so that's to show an example that often comes up so yeah they make believe in order to this was very important for us when we started out we wanted to make sure that what we do actually has significant impact and that we avoid greenwashing. We're fully aware that the road to hell is paved with great intentions. And we, we did a lot of work on ensuring that at least we avoid it as good as we can using the science that we know today. We've hired a Professor Pomponi, uh, who's an international renowned expert in so-called life cycle assessments, completely new methodology that suits a venture firm. Currently, LCAs are mostly using lag data. So what we have to project a lot into the future as we sort of looked at future technology. So we, we, we have a methodology, it's called Epic, which we share openly. Um, it's a, you can download on our website, which is the full methodology on how we see, how we try to predict impact in the future and make sure that we do something that has a significant impact. You'll be surprised how many, especially in the beginning, how many deals that we thought would be amazing for climate it ended up being killed because when you do the math you find out actually the impact is a lot smaller than you and you thought it would be we also initially thought there might be more digital solutions for example that would really help us um, uh, to decarbonize the simple truth is um, hardware is polluting the planet and that's where we need to fix it as unsexy as it often is for for markets this is what it is, uh, CO2 is a molecule. You can't blockchain it away. So um, we'll have to find ways to deal with it um, in old engineering and chemical and physics based solutions. Huh? So we're going to get to that and we're going to get to uh, a couple of the, um, the more interesting projects you're involved in. But let's start kind of where we uh, left off when we met in Berlin Kind of what's your worldview? Just take off your pedigree of your history and your current job. How do you see the, the world in our society right now with respect to our economy and energy and, and climate and population and growth and, and everything? Yeah, that's a big, big question. Obviously, I think it's, it's obvious that we are in a time where 
strong shifts are occurring. Yeah, We've been in a fairly sort of comfortable zone for the last 60, 70 years since the end of World War II, more or less. Uh, we've seen a steady period of peace, which, or at least for the majority of the planet. Uh, we've seen a steady rise in wealth and income and lifting people out of po poverty for the last many years. And now all of a sudden things are changing again. Yeah, we are, We're looking at a darker picture uh, we're looking at a potentially long-term change yeah not just be a short-term downturn and we might see a long-term change um this is a lot to do with what we i think both commonly believe yeah that we are that we're waking up from a grand bonanza and are are facing a major hangover yeah that we we've overconsumed for many decades we've created quite the mess in our fiesta and uh, now it's time to see that we've are we we've hit and overstepped many planetary boundaries we are close to reaching many tipping points and yeah, this is a realization we we have we've long tried to ignore. And science been telling us for a very long time, and if we would have acted when we were told, we we would have potentially be today in a very different situation. Um, but we didn't. We tend to like to ignore it, and now we are in not just because of climate, also politically and 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 security wise in a completely different world. All of a sudden, threats from the past are coming back out, and these political struggles that we're seeing right now and the situation here in Europe has a lot to do with energy. Huh? And at the end of the day, it's, it's about resources, it's about power. And they're, those two are exactly connected as well. Yeah? As in, no, um, so yeah, we are in times of significant change, significant shifts. We'll see where it takes us. I can't predict the future also, but for sure, there's a lot more uncertainty than there has been before. Huh? So when we met six weeks ago, we remarked that even with everything going on with Ukraine and Russia and the European energy situation, that it seemed like people in Berlin, people in Germany were still startlingly energy blind, that they really hadn't set in. Has that changed in the last six weeks? Um, this We're recording this on September 15th. Are, are, are people coming to understand this? I think slowly, um, slowly, <laughs> majority, because most of us are currently receiving letters from your local utility company showing us that for sure, let's assume we have a supply um, this winter, it will be becoming extremely expensive. Huh? And the news are full of whatever bakeries and other business owners that say, oh, we can no longer afford to bake our bread because it's insanely expensive. Our, our gas bills went from whatever, like 10x to, <laughs> to heat the ovens. So th these are effects. yeah. And of course, on the other hand, you also have now in the news that companies are, are starting to lay off yeah, because of energy costs um, uh, being simply too high. So I think this is something that has changed in the last six weeks. We met in a slightly rainy, but still a summery day. Yeah? Now it's starting to get colder. People are starting to heat. I was actually this morning, I was reading an interview with the, with the head of the German um, energy network agency saying that he was actually surprised to see that the household now in the first couple of days of sort of uh, slightly cooler temperatures have demanded significantly more energy than he would have expected. Yeah? So there's still some energy blindness as it seems, or I don't know if, whose it is. Is it the state owners or the private individual houses? But I guess uh, we will all feel it in our pockets this year that it'll be just an extremely expensive winter. And there's also the question, will we see actual situations of scarcity yeah? where there will not be enough supply? Um, I think there's nobody can predict this because it depends on a lot of factors, including the weather and also the weather, not only in Germany, but also with the neighbor states. And, you know, they, they, they potentially can supply, but it depends on their own sort of consumption. And so there's a lot of factors coming into play it's that we can't fully uh, predict today. But it's totally on the map that we might see actually situations where we selectively have to shut off certain regions from gas supply. Electricity seems a bit more stable, although that also depends. Again, we are in Europe, we have a connected grid. It depends to a good extent on the situation in France. You know, will it rain? <laughs> will the nuclear power stations come back on? There's, there's some uncertainty still left. Yeah? But yeah, I think st slowly starting, people are starting to realize it's, it's, it's actually real and it's actually very, very uncomfortable. So I have 
a lot of questions on this, Sebastian. But before I forget, you mentioned the baker is starting to get worried because it costs 10 times more to heat the oven. I'm not really a bread person, but when I was in Berlin, I had the best pastries and bread in my life. And the person there, my friend (laughs) who took me there said it's because the way they mill the flour, they grind it smaller or something. But like the breakfast pastry there, you cannot buy that in the United States anywhere. It was unbelievable. I'm just FYI, you're probably used to it or something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, there's a huge culture. There's a huge culture around bread here. Obviously, this is a bread country for sure. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and that's and it, it's also one of the basic nutrition for pretty much anyone over here. Yeah, and uh, this now see you know we will see bread prices. There's a possibility that they will rise to like ten euros um, a bread, so whatever eleven dollars for bread. This is insane. So in in the UK and in other countries, they have uh, they're introducing energy caps that house households have to pay a lot for energy, but it's capped and above the cap, the government will pay for uh, above that. Is that also happening in Germany or not? Not yet. I think it's it's going to come because uh, I think otherwise we'll be overloading the system pretty madly. They recently announced the 65 billion recovery act, but that's sort of more of a one-time payment towards your energy bills or something. And not for every household, uh, sort of it's for students and elderly and some others. Yeah? There's a bit of a different system, like the, the very underprivileged or very uh, low, low income households. Um, they anyhow have subsidies for the energy bills even today. Yeah. So that's just going to anyhow land on the pockets of the state. Everybody living on social welfare or some type of subsidies. They typically have some type of scheme already in place. But a lot of even middle income uh, families will will face a tough time. Um, with all of a sudden, you're seeing, you know, a thousand bucks more per month going towards energy. So it's going to be significant. Uh, it's not just a few, you know. 10, 50 bucks, it's going to be, or could be significant. It all depends how the gas price evolves. And of course, the markets could also turn completely different once we see that there is a chance that we make the winter, that it actually, that solutions are coming in place. The markets might completely relax as well, you know. God knows. I mean, the the storages are quite well filled, better than they predicted. And also, I think the imports from neighbors such as Norway and the Netherlands are also working better than they expected. Yeah? So maybe the markets turn completely. As of last week, obviously, the imports of Russian gas are substantially down, but the imports of overall gas are only down like 5% or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Russian gas at the moment, I think zero. Uh, we, we haven't had any imports for the last couple of days. Yeah. So broadly, do you think this is what's happening now is kind of a indictment of the energy wind uh, uh, strategy pursued by Germany over the last 15, 20 years? Or what are your thoughts on that? Unfortunately, yes, it is. I mean, and this is uh, the term that you sort of brought to me and I've been using it actually myself quite a bit. You know, we energy um, has, we've been definitely blind uh, to at least certain aspects of energy over here. Although that also to be fair, a lot of people warned us that this, uh, what, so the so-called energy transition that we were planning here has significant uh, dangers. Yeah? And I think the, the guiding principle behind our energy transition has been ecologically motivated. And we're seeing now that we should have considered economic and security factors a lot more. Countries like the US have a very clear strategic uh, agenda when it comes to energy. The US has invested a significant amount of subsidies or, or also private capital over the past decades to become completely energy independent yeah, um, through shell gas and, and, but also traditional oil and gas and renewables. 85%, not a hundred, but 85% energy independent. Yeah. Or to a large degree, energy independent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's, this is strategic. Even our neighbors, to be honest, have had this on their agenda much more. Countries like the UK have had laws for maximum imports for many years. Yeah? So we cannot import more than, more than whatever, 30 or 40, whatever the number is, but percent of our energy, the rest we need to source locally. Yeah? So that's strategic thinking, which we lack completely. On top of it, 
coming sort of so that sort of uh, ecologic uh, priority came in combination with the liberalized energy market led to the market looking for the cheapest solution to find an alternative to the economic the ecologically no longer wanted solutions which were prim primarily coal and nuclear um, but both are have important baseload properties. So we ended up building a lot of wind and solars. We the uh, so-called renewable energy act that was came well, whatever nineties and end of nineties or beginning of two thousands by the by sort of a red green coalition back then is the second largest economic undertaking this country has done since the other one would be the German reunification. So a very large economic undertaking. And we yeah, built out a lot of intermittent sources. But that also meant in turn that the baseload moved more and more towards gas. Uh, and right. this gas, the only way to source such gas at a decent cost uh, is from our neighbor Russia. They are, uh, for sure have the largest reserves on the planet. It's The pipelines uh, were partially there. Or we were quite easy to build short. And that was the simple solution the market went for. The liberal market looks for the best solution. We kind of, I've been criticizing it for a while, uh, sort of polemically saying that behind every windmill, there's a gas turbine. Uh, uh, but that's kind of, that picture is not too too far off reality. Uh, and yeah, this is, this is, I think we were warned yeah? also by the US, by the way. Uh, I mean, your previous government was putting sanctions on Germany for, I mean, we're, we're an ally yeah? and they were putting sanctions on us for Nord Stream 2. But still, we decided to put the majority of our energy imports into the mercy of a non-ally, which kind of is bizarre, to be honest. I mean, it it's <laughs> sounds uh, not very thought through. Yeah, I mean, you have an ally on one side and uh, or several, and then you decide to put the fate of your country into the hands of a non-ally who is, has a pretty shady track record. Yeah. And you could almost say, I'm, well, it's actually, I'm pretty sure that this was long-term planned from Russians the whole the whole sort of conflict there and uh, they're using energy clearly as a weapon uh, there's no doubt about it that energy is, is a weapon and that uh, germany or the whole western europe is a clear target uh, of this weapon this is what you and i talked about when we had dinner is that if 20 years ago people were less energy blind and they looked at energy as the fundamental building block of our economic engines instead of dollars and technological combinations, maybe these decisions wouldn't have been made. So I think what's happening with Ukraine and Russia and Germany is a big biophysical wake up call for people to see that we need energy at every part of our economies to create, invent, maintain, run, deliver, dispose of. There's nothing that happens without energy. And so I, I wonder, and here's the other thought I had, Sebastian, I think the German spirit of doing the right thing ecologically is where my heart and spirit is at. But I think given what the world faces, I, I fear that the right thing ecologically is going to lose out in the short term to the urgent thing economically. So I ask you getting back it to your to. work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just getting back to your work for a second. What do you think about the world now moving towards energy security as what they optimize as opposed to low carbon as what they optimize? I mean, currently, all the measures that we can see are from a climate perspective, a disaster. Yeah, I mean, keeping nuclear power running, I wouldn't label it as a disaster. That's actually a uh, smart thing to do it's already sunk cost kind of and sunk carbon as well you know you've got you built it all it's there you can you should you should utilize it building new uh, as i mentioned earlier on i think it's it's too late you know it would take too long time uh, but the consequence of course we are firing up coal again well, what else can we do uh, in the end of the day you said it or you hinted to it uh, we had quite we talked about that six weeks ago quite a bit that what people have not understand fully uh, not full enough is that our growth and our wealth depends to a very large degree on the amount of carbon we consume. Uh? 
through energy. Energy is uh, 75% of our carbon budget and that's where the problem is. And what we try to do with our firm to come to the solutions part now is to do exactly this. We want to unlink or uncouple carbon and growth. Yeah, that we we come to a green growth yeah? uh, because that's actually the only way forward. Yeah? I mean, if, if we don't find that way, then we have to go com- a completely different way. And you've also been sort of uh, showing how that way could look like, but that's a completely different way. This is a, a way in which our society fundamentally will change. Yeah? Uh, if we want to have any chance of continuing growing as a, and, and this is not so much about only growth in the Western world where we already have a very comfortable life. It's also about growth in, in other areas of the globe where where people are living in, in under still very different circumstances and rightfully so demand that they also have access to energy and access to resources. If we, yeah, we, we don't find that solution, we will also see socioeconomic, like very complicated situations. Yeah. We are also, again, Germany, we were worried about a migration crisis in 2015 with the war in Syria that will look like small to compare what could come. I agree. I'm very skeptical, highly, highly skeptical of a green growth outcome. And yet I sympathize with people advocating for green growth because many of them understand that the alternative, which is negative growth and the social and economic and political and, and geopolitical response to that is very dangerous. So I sympathize with we have to somehow figure out a way forward without I mean the way I refer to it is we have to bend not break because break would be bad so I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit of some of the technologies you have in mind but let's just keep on the German situation well you live there so I'm sure you're aware of the last few days it's been discussed that your largest energy company Uniper might be nationalized by the government Given the centrality yeah. of energy to our economies, I've long thought that the eventual path was we're going to have to nationalize energy companies because they're so central to how things work. But do you have any opinions on that, on what's going on? Or It is an interesting question. Of course, I'm generally a person who prefers uh, capitalistic structures, but energy is a specific sector where it's hard to draw the line of energy. You know, it's not just energy. And there's energy comes in so many forms and shapes and so many things are directly related to energy and um, so where do you draw this line is it just a supply of energy but generally energy is something extremely strategic yeah, um, for sure and it actually has always been as well strategic I mean of course how do we create energy a lot of it is from, nat- from natural resources which belong to the people and not necessarily to, to a single corporation or person I'm generally a friend of the system like that some countries like Norway run where you know you get dividends from the energy that's been sold to other countries the energy belongs yeah, in in many ways uh, to the people and therefore yeah there, there might be a point for looking at least uh, this more strategically I think the way we're trying to do this at the moment is yes they're uh, privatized companies but also they work in highly regulated space yeah they, they can't just do whatever they want the space is already extremely regulated and they they sort of fairly small boundaries or actually very high protection walls the other way around to be honest from creating too much competition in the market that goes also a bit too far i guess into the design of the market but it's not a market where you can just do whatever you want there's a lot of requirements that you have to meet and i'm not sure if the nationalization is then the only way my experience with nationalized companies also isn't great typically they're highly inefficient and also prone to corruption and co so um I'm not sure that this is the way forward, but open for discussion. Generally, I am with you. Energy is extremely strategic. But, you know, in the U.S. is actually an example as well. You know, with, with enough subsidies for fracking, you've been able to create largely energy independence. Yeah? So it's also a way to... Uh, Short-term independence, because that fracking is depleting at only. 80% in the, in the 18 months sort of thing. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's, all, it's all extremely short term. It's only bridge technology too. But I think that's even that's realized. I mean, the uh, actually re- just recently the Inflation Reduction Act that you have put together in the US is pretty impressive to be honest. Piece of legislation for for renewables now. So depends on who's in who's governing as well in Washington, but or also in the state levels. But uh, there is, I mean. It, in general, I feel there's a very strategic thinking about energy in the US and. 
this is still a wake up call definitely for Germany, but also true really for the most of Europe. I mean, this, this goes further. I mean, we were trying to now become a hydrogen economy uh, because again, for ecological reasons, uh, hydrogen, but it's also clear that Europe will never be able to produce its own hydrogen. Uh, we simply don't have enough energy to do this, uh, green energy. So we will always depend on imports. I think Germany estimates that at, at a best case scenario with current sort of planning, we would have to still import 70% of our hydrogen. It's, it's a kind yeah. of the same mistake. You might be, just not might be Russia, but still. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say the quiet part out loud, my friend. The biggest gigacorn <laughs> is, is using less using less resources and and less uh, indirectly and directly less carbon but of course we can't vote for such an outcome and it will never happen voluntarily do you have any thoughts on that no uh, for sure i mean uh, if we would be able i mean there, there's many angles to that as well you know where, where do you really start and but for sure i mean the, the ultimate problem is overconsumption. i think that's fully with you. And if we are able to consume less, that would help a lot. The issue is we are growing population yeah, and not a decreasing population. We're strongly growing population. So that's something we should really start digging into the fact that and here education comes in. You know, We are now a CO2 play fund, but we are fully consent and fully see that's not the only solution, just decarbonizing. We also need to work holistically on the problem and holistically has, has many factors. We, we're, not, we're not blind and just a carbon direction we, we do understand but now we're an investment fund and we need to speak sort of the language of the markets a bit um, and let's say education is not necessarily something that suits itself well for a capitalistic uh, system right now in, investing into this but however it needs to be done of course it, it's i think it's it's clear that educated women get significantly less children as uneducated women and that's for example one charity I, uh, I support and uh, I think they're doing great work it's called Educating Girls and they're working exactly on that in India specifically but also elsewhere I think they're expanding but working on, on giving education to to females and it's 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 amazing the impact they're able to achieve you know? with little tools uh, it of course requires a lot of local community work but it's it's in the end it's simple work it's, it's going to the families speaking about the importance of sending their daughters to school paying the farmers for letting them go to school. Yeah? And the effect is amazing. And once it's also interesting, once you break that cycle, once you send one generation to school, the likelihood that the next generation will also be educated is significantly higher. So it's basically you break the cycle once and you break it for good. Yeah? So, yeah, there, there's many angles to it. That's some, uh, for sure, a topic we need to deal with. And the overpopulation is mostly a t topic in developing countries. I think in the Europe and US, it's anyhow, we're not growing uh, by birth rates, but mostly by immigration at the moment. I think, whatever, in Germany, the birth rate is 1.3 or something like this per per couple. So it's quite negative. Huh? But what but one American consumes the same as like 10 or 15 Filipinos though. So there's, there's two population Clearly. problems. Yeah, yeah, there's sure. Population of people and population of refrigerators and cars and, and everything else. Of course. Now that's all, that's also, we, we, that there might be things that we simply will do less in the future. Huh? The hard part is of course, sort of going this sort of half, half earther movement. I mean, there's so many, so many problems with that on a, the level where where decisions become almost uh, theological and and uh, at least morally very complicated i uh, yeah I, I wouldn't know how to really do this and this feels a bit like being in a batman what is it batman yeah a batman movie right <laughs> <laughs> trying to yeah i i mean everything is morally complicated if you understand what's going on on the planet everything is morally complicated because there are no easy yes. answers so so let's get back to your your work and your focus so you want to develop low carbon technologies that replace or invent new ones that allow us to get our same brain services uh, of our lives using technology and materials and stuff, but using far less carbon than we currently do. So you're, you understand that we can't decouple GDP from energy or not by much anyways, but we could decouple energy from carbon energy. Yes. 
Absolutely, absolutely, and and this is this is. I mean, and we are on this track already. We are building out renewable energies. We've invested, I think, roughly three trillion as a as a as a planet into the build out of wind and solar over the last many decades. That's a significant amount of money for not that great of an outcome so far. I think we have five percent roughly globally of wind and solar supplied, but still, I mean, we 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 are inventing in the space, and what we think is we should simply look at the areas with most potential and. Gen- General. I mean, we have we have certain finite resources on the planet, finite resources of coal, oil, fossil fuels, and uranium. Basically, those are finite resources, and we have a whole bunch of renewable resources: sun being one, wind being one, waves, tidal, geothermal, biomass, and and and, and a few others. Yeah of minor concern, but I think those are the ones we need to look at and need to understand, is there more potential in these now than we're currently developing? And of course, in wind and solar, we are on a good track. The problem with wind and solar is that there actually are not an energy transition, but an addition. Yeah, So we're adding electrons to the grid, but they're not transitioning us away from the other ones because the other ones are the ones supplying the base load, which we now, through thanks to Germany, maybe understand finally how important it is. Uh, thanks for learning that lesson. But that this is the, the, the issue. This is an energy addition. We need a transition. We need to find an energy source that has the similar or same properties than we have from our finite resources. There are, there are hydro is an example. For example, today clearly um, hydro is, is widely used, but also pretty much at the end of its capacity. You know, we're only we, hydro has been used already. There will be modern hydro that has certain uh, benefits, some pumped hydro. So there, there's certainly some potential also there still there. And I'd say if, if somebody can find a way how to very efficiently use slow moving water, be it rivers, be it ocean currents and so on, there would be huge potential hydro. There would be terawatts of hydro in that uh, energy source. Huh? But currently, technically, we're not able to. But that's, and again, that's potential. That's what we should look into. Do we find ways how to enable hydro, for example? And same counts for all the other renewable energy sources. Biomass, can we be more efficient uh, harvesting our biomass? Or uh, geothermal is, is one that we're also quite keen on uh, because that's obviously has the biggest potential. I mean, we're sitting on the giant battery. It's called Earth. Uh, we have some type of nuclear reaction at the core of Earth. So it's all, all also a renewable source of energy. It's not that we deplete it and then sort of the plant cools out. It's actually continuously renewing its heat. And that is just a gigantic amount of heat behind, below our feet. I mean, here we go to cosmic scales now for billions of years. I think there's a study showing that 0% of geothermal energy would power humanity for 2 million years. Yeah? Uh, 0.1%. Yeah? So that's the amount of energy we have. There are studies um, done actually um, by some US folks at Cornell University quantifying this energy resource below our feet and the numbers are just purely gigantic in, in, in terms of exajoules. So that's again, this is now I'm talking, there's potential. The question is now, how do we make use of this potential? Uh, and by the way, uranium, uh, just to at least be fair to it, there is also, I think there would uh, could be other generations of nuclear generation three, four, five, whatever, which would make a very efficient use of re- uranium and therefore expand the lifetime of this finite resource to a very, very long time. And I think that's the argument that a lot of sort of uh, pro-nuclear people argue, let us use this uranium to transition us to nuclear fusion. I'm not fully against this. My only problem again with that is time. Time to impact for nuclear is way too slow. You know? But Potential. There's potential. And that's what we're looking at. As, as, a, as a venture capitalist, we're looking at potential. We see a lot of potential in geothermal. We see a lot of potential in, in biomass. We do see potential in hydro as well. So those are the, the areas we're looking at and see what can be technologically enabled. Yeah. If we get more efficient in biomass, if we add more energy to the system that's a low, but that's low carbon variety, Ultimately, that has to be coupled with a new governance or a new cultural aspiration uh, other than what we currently have, because our current system is optimizing monetary profits that doesn't have any scale or destination other than to grow. So if we were to use our materials more efficiently, there's a rebound effect that the money that we save here will just be spent on some other things that have indirect carbon on them at the store. So I just want to set that aside to see if you agree or disagree with that before we get into the technical possibilities. 
I do agree. We need to we need to find. Uh, I mean, uh, humans have always been, and there, there's a law. I forgot the name of the law, but Javin's paradox. Yeah, exactly. That's a Javin's paradox. That's exactly what it is. I mean, the more energy you give the system, the more it will consume. Yeah, and even uh, meaning that if you would give it unlimited energy, it would also be consuming unlimited energy. Um, so I guess you're also familiar with Kardashev scale on on civilizations. That's that's sort of co- co- course sort of on, on a grand scheme of things comes comes into into mind we are still a stage one civilization we are probably at the brink of becoming a stage two because we also now are slightly being forced to become a stage two what, what is stage two stage two is a um, is a society that's able to harvest energy from the galaxy let's say yeah beyond sort of uh, solar would be one yeah? that we're able to harvest from our galaxy or well, actually from our solar system I think the entire galaxy that's a stage three then yeah but uh, from our from our sort of close solar system we're able to harvest energy well we've been using energy from the sun for a long time but you mean something more than that yeah energy independent as well we, we, we're completely energy independent yeah we, we're um, that would be stage two stage one is still dependent on finite resources but stage two is completely energy independent and and you think we're approaching that that point possibly <laughs> not yet I mean uh, for sure not yet uh, I think the initial list I mean there there's uh, you can read articles and articles about that estimations are, are widely different but um, some people would say we're sort of on track to reach it in the next 100 to 200 years uh, also long term some people say it's probably uh, a couple thousand years away i think stage three is believed to be like extremely far away millions of years yeah so yeah at the moment we're stage one for the foreseeable future for our lives will remain stage one yeah, yeah. so <laughs> And we have a problem. We have a problem with climate change that we need to solve before we become stage two. That's we need to be very clear about this. We cannot think in cosmic scales here. Climate yeah. change and the destruction of our natural habitat is something that we cannot think in so these sort of long term scales. Which is actually, I by agree. the way, sometimes I'm, I, I am put off by these people who are trying to push all the problems into the really, really long term. That's not the luxury we have, that we have right now. I agree with you. I'm glad you said that because there's been a lot of that in the news. Um, Nick Bostrom and McCaskill, others <laughs> lately. Exactly. It's just to me, all that stuff is ecocidal because our 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 challenge is right now. We're headed for an Earth Trek future yeah. and we need to save the biosphere and have some sort of runway um, uh, to get society through the next 30 years. Okay. With that very long introduction, uh, one of the things that you and I spoke a lot about uh, in Germany that I would like you to unpack a little bit is you, and not only you, um, I've met many other people that are very excited about the possibility not only of geothermal, but of deep geothermal. Can you describe what that is and how it might work and how that might be a game changer and, and go from there? Absolutely. As I mentioned earlier on, the Earth is the largest battery um, that we currently sit on. There is estimations from from the U, uh, this is about US only now that uh, the US has a potential that uh, of, of so called crystalline hard rock geothermal, which is uh, geothermal sitting in in fairly deep, let's say anywhere between three and ten kilometers, depends on where you are, of th- I think rough numbers roughly thirteen million exajoules. That's an insane amount of energy. Yeah, this is more than all other sources that we know today: wind, solar, uranium, coal, and everything combined, by far more. Yeah, so that's a again a, a very large potential. Let me stop you right there because is that the same analogy to measuring that there is uranium in seawater, which is true. There is uranium in seawater. There's also gold in seawater, but it takes a lot of energy yeah. and materials to get that out. So is that a fair analogy or uh, and the technology would be more targeted in this case? That's sort of what we've sort of then looked at. And we actually find, of course, it, it requires technological shifts, but the big but you know, when we when we started wind and solar, there was actually very little existing technology that we could use. There was very little industry experience that we could use, and still we've been able to scale it extremely well. And now see a really interesting cost curve on those technologies. The interesting part about uh, geothermal, the, the question about geothermal is the only question: how to get deep? How do you access this depth and energy? This depth, and this is all about the technologies for drilling. So we happen to have, and most of it is actually centered out in Houston, the U.S., right, again, 
a global drilling industry that has been drilling roughly, well, has a capacity of somewhere around 100,000 wells per year that are that are being drilled. And they've they've been extremely efficient with bringing down costs um, for for all of these technologies over the last many decades. Yeah? Previously, a, a a well in Texas somewhere would require a couple hundred people and a few months of work. Today, it's done in 10 days with four people. And you see the extreme cost curve uh, coming down once people are, are starting to take it seriously. And they typically take it seriously when it's an economic great opportunity. So that is so that's very different to all the other energy sources. So we have actually a massive industry, which has a lot of a lot of experience. And I'd say actually probably 80 to 90 percent of the tools already that are required to utilize this energy resource. Plus, sort of, uh, they have know-how, they have assets, they have skilled labor too. So they, they, this is actually poised to scale in an extremely interesting way. And that's different to all other energy sources, which are which cannot scale as fast as they could potentially scale. So that's for me the uh, one of the, the, the key points where we believe it, it, it can really have a, a major breakthrough. The Of course, like I said, we need new technology. It's also quite simple. I mean, uh, today... This global drilling industry is searching pretty much for f hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are found in so-called sediment rocks. The one thing you do not find in crystalline hard rocks is oil or gas you know, or any, any sort of hydrocarbons. So that's for, there was never a need to develop a tool that would actually um, satisfy this need. There was some geothermal always, but the geothermal also so far has been only used in sediment rocks. We we don't drill geothermal in hard rocks, again, because there's no tools for it. So we use geothermal today wherever it's easily available at low depths. So next to a volcano, next to a fault, San Francisco, San Andreas Fault, the Geysers is one of the largest geothermal um, areas in the world. You know, there's several hundred megawatts coming out of there um, powering the city of San Francisco. And how deep, how deep do they have to drill for that? Not deep at all. Not too deep. No, no, because it's a very active, tectonically active area. And what about Iceland? Iceland is the El Dorado of geothermal energy. It's a country that um, uses a significant part of its energy mix is geothermal. The other part is hydro. So they are a completely energy independent country using no fossils or finite resources of any kind. And they also still have a lot more potential for geothermal. They can build this out. Of course, it's a tiny nation, but it's an interesting country to visit, to be honest, because you, you see how a society can look that lives in energy abundance. They live in energy abundance. When you come to Iceland, they ask you, can you bring me a project that consumes energy? Yeah, I have a lot of energy. Why don't you have an idea? They can, we will, we know investors and other stuff like e-fuels and they will think, can we, can we build an e-fuels factory here? No, we have heat. We have plenty of power. Um, that's what you guys need is input. Interestingly enough for e-fuels, we also need carbon. And what the society there does not have is carbon. They have mm. other than cars. They have basically no carbon consumption. Interesting enough, and then cars also electrifying also there. So soon there'll be a society without any carbon. The airport is still one of the main main, main consumers of carbon. Right. But yeah, it's right. interesting that they're pretty much a carbon-free society. So the problem for building an e-fuels plant there is how the hell to get the carbon, where to get the carbon from. And the answer would be direct air capturing in this particular case, but that's the technology which is also still quite in its infancy. So, but right. yeah, it'll... It's interesting to see how that works. So what's the main difference between geothermal as we know it today, and it's in many places around the world, as you mentioned, and deep geothermal? Well, the name implies it. It's depth. Yeah, and, and But the other part is that it's... it's how, how deep? So between three and 10 kilometers is a realistic assumption. It depends on where, really where you are. And, and in, in certain parts of the globe, you will hit the hard rock after... Three kilometers, yeah. Maybe in other places like Turkey or Finland, even earlier, yeah. And in other places, you could be drilling through sediment rock for five, six, seven kilometers. I think Canada has some areas where it's really deep sediments, yeah. It really depends. But in the end of the day, the Earth has so-called temperature gradients all over the place, and they they vary from place to place. Iceland has a temperature gradient of roughly 120, meaning that for each kilometer you go, it gets 120 degrees warmer 
most of the U.S. is probably in the 30s to 50s. Uh, that's a, sort of a normal temperature gradient, except for the hot zones like San Andreas Fault or so, some other areas yeah, where, where, where it's warmer. Yosemite, I think, is one. So then we have a higher gradient. So that depends. So in certain areas, and I think the entire west of the U.S. is pretty interesting for geothermal. The east is quite a bit cooler. It means you have to go deeper. Yeah? At some stage, you will always hit the temperature. Yeah, there's, there's no area in the world where you will not get to the temperature you need. And that's the issue today. Geothermal is pretty much uh, in, in most areas. The high heat above 250 degrees is typically too deep, so we're using it for fairly shallow um, uses, and, and hence also quite mostly for heating, less for electricity production. So, what are the main technological pathways for a potential breakthrough for deep geothermal up to 10 kilometers, um, like you said, through igneous and metamorphic rock? What are what are the big pathways and, and challenges technologically? Technological challenges are mostly in drilling. Yeah, the drilling equipment, the current PBC rock, uh, drill bits that we use are not made for drilling efficiently in hard rock. Uh, that's simply not made for it. So the technologies that are being um, researched today, there's different approaches. Um, so we're investors in, in, in one of those, but they are either plasma-based or millimeter wave based. So anything that works with the extreme amount of heat that eventually disintegrates the rock or, or weakens the rock and allows you to uh, therefore drill efficiently. Yeah? The millimeter wave is actually sort of kind of vaporize the rock yeah? and you, you sort of suck up uh, dust more or less. Yeah? That those type of technologies that allow you to drill linear. Today's drilling cost is exponential. The deeper you go, the more expensive it gets. And once you hit hard rock, it gets insanely exponential. Um, your drill bits sometimes, what does it mean exponential? It simply means your drill bit lasts nothing. Yeah, the amount of energy you put up at top, by the time it goes down there, it's, it's almost nothing left. And your, your drilling is extremely slow, meaning, and you have to constantly change the bits, which requires you to so, do so-called tripping. You need to take out all the pipes, put them all back in again, put and you will take them out put a new bit in, take them, take it down again. This takes a long time yeah, and, and also consumes a lot of resources. And that's where the exponentiality comes from, that sometimes a bit in hard rock can last for only for a couple of meters before you have to exchange it again. And that at four or five kilometer depth is just extremely slow. We have drilled very deep. Uh, we have drilled uh, uh, several projects which are um, extremely deep and also reach, I think, 12 kilometers the deepest in Russia, Kola super deep. But those were not drilled for energy reasons. They were drilled for scientific purposes and they also didn't have economic uh, or time as a as a measure in there. Yeah? This was completely completely different research. So uh, that's something we need to we need to find drilling technologies that allow us to A drill efficient hard rock and basically be drilled close to linear, that we have a very predictive uh, cost in our geothermal projects. But it's not the only thing is not drilling. It's also you then need to make sure that you have efficient heat transfer. Uh, you need to build uh, systems that allow the fluid that you pump. And it eventually works like a big heating, a big heater, right? You basically take a cold fluid. It goes through a radiator and comes up as a warm fluid, yeah? more or less, <laughs> to simplify it. You put fluid all the way down up to 10 kilometers and it comes up another drilled hole as, as heat? Exactly. That's how it works. So you typically have in geothermal, you have so-called injections and production wells. Uh, you have typically it's a so-called triplet you drill. Um, so two injection wells and one production well. And the injection well puts in cold fluid, yeah, typically water, yeah, and it comes up as warm water or ideally as uh, supercritical water. Um, uh, supercritical is uh, the fourth state that water can take. And that's a very specific state, very interesting. State. So hotter than steam? Yeah, a lot hotter, but also under pressure. It only works in a combination of steam and pressure. Supercritical, we have at 374 degrees Celsius and 200 bars of pressure. And this is for water now. For other fluids, it's different. I think, for example, CO2 uh, becomes supercritical at somewhere in the low 30s or uh, 30 celsius yeah so fairly so you can also put in other fluids but let's say let's say we use water that's how it gets super super critical the beauty about super critical why is it important why does it matter because it's able to transport roughly 10 times the amount of energy than 
non-supercritical water can transport, meaning it gets extremely efficient to produce energy with supercritical conditions. So, But in order to become supercritical, you need to make sure that the fluid that you pump down there also heats up. So there's work to be done on the well itself to make sure that you have an efficient heat exchange below the ground. So it's one part is drilling, the other part is the heat exchange that we need to solve. Well, I'm probably not the best person to grill you on this uh, because I'm not an engineer and I don't understand all this. So I'm just going to ask you naive, like uh, general citizen questions about this process. But you're going to yeah. drill an injection well for water and then you or some other substance and then you have a producing well where the supercritical heat comes. How, how do you get the water from the injection well to the producing well? And if you're so many kilometers under the earth, doesn't it just dissipate down there? Uh, or how does it get from one place to the next? Actually, once you are in, in, in these crystalline hard rocks, you're pretty much in a stable formation of rock. Yeah? It's, it's one single type of rock. And it actually also doesn't have a lot of cracks around it. There's not much instability in this type of rock. You have these cracks and instabilities in the sediment rocks. That's what you typically do to do in geothermal today. You, that's the part you case. Yeah, You have some type of cementing or put on a pipe or something. Yeah. Once you're in hard rock, you uh, TBD, to be honest, we'll, we'll see after the first project if you need to pipe it or not, but it's likely that you don't. The way to do it is you actually have to build some type of heat exchange mechanism. There's different technologies without going to too much detail, but there's so-called closed loop technologies and there's so-called open loop technologies. There are different approaches. Um, all of them might work. Ensuring that we have an efficient heat transfer from the rock to the fluid. Basically, a lot of technology from fracking can be applied here. That's how fracking in many ways works. But wouldn't fractures that deep just automatically be closed tight because of the pressure at that level? Um, you would think so, but not necessarily. No, I mean, you have to work on it. Also, what they do today in, in, in fracking, they are using some type of ceramics to keep these fractures open. But again, this is pretty much technology that we derive from today's processes. There is not much new innovation needed the difference i mean it depends again you can also uh, depend on which technology you're looking at but the, fr the fracking is one technology other companies actually sort of do a closed loop system basically la laying pipes down there which are superconductive pipes yeah so there there is uh, it, it depends uh, which technological approach you will use but all of these technologies actually are derived from fracking today and when we met, you told me that there's the the fracking, the drilling, the millimeter wave or the plasma, et cetera. But there's also, you said they're applying proprietary things from the nuclear safety industry to protect the equipment at, at such heat and pressure. Yes. That's the that's one of the uh, engineering challenges that needs to be solved. I mean, these type of drilling technologies often require electronics for sensoring, which means you need to take electronics downhaul. And electronics, obviously, when it gets very hot, need to be shielded. And there is basically military or nuclear technologies that are able to withhold these type of four five hundred degrees temperatures. That's not completely unheard of, but that's something that oil and gas, for example, that's a typical challenge they haven't had so far. They never went so hot. So here we uh, here we can not rely on today's technology. Same with the drill heads. We need different type of drill heads, but on the shielding electronics from heats, we will, there's, there's work to be done on that front. But again, this is something with diligence, of course, when we looked at the technologies and we spoke to experts in other industries that are dealing with these type of conditions, that it's mostly military and nuclear, or actually also uh, uh, fusion reactors. So there is material science available today or, or there are materials in the, in the market today that are able to handle this. They haven't been tested yet for this type of purpose, um, but that's something that's a, that's a challenge that we need to solve. But again, an engineering challenge, not a scientific challenge. So today, the U.S. Department of Energy released a plan to lower geothermal costs with big R&D and subsurface research, etc. I'll send you uh, the link. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Oh, you saw it. Okay. So... All of a sudden, I'm hearing about this everywhere. How many <laughs> firms are, are working on this? And what is the next milestone in seeing if this is going to actually work or not? How many companies are working on this? A few, not a crazy amount, but there will be globally, I don't know, like 20, 30 geothermal tech companies actually innovating in the space on, on different angles of it. There's, for example, I just mentioned that there's companies working 
specifically on the electronics issues. Yeah, there's a Houston-based company doing that. There's companies that work specifically on the drilling challenge. Um, in the US, it's, there's a company called Quays. In Europe, there's a company called GA Drilling. There, there, there are companies like also US, I mean, most of my US, to be honest, like Sage um, or Green Fire or Geothermic Solutions that are all working with some elements of, of, of solving this problem. Ever is another one out of Canada, which is quite advanced. Fervo is, is a bit of a different game, but also working on, on enhancing geothermal has just uh, also been able to attract a large amount of investment, which was sort of a little bit in the news for geothermal companies. That's a large amount of investment. And three years ago would have been unthinkable, but they did a hundred something million round just the other day. So there's companies working on it. There's capital flowing into it. That's the most important question. Is there capital flowing into it? Is somebody funding this? Huh? And that's the interesting part now that certainly Houston is waking up and certainly Houston is trying to take this is, is now starting to take the series and is starting to invest into it as well all of the major Houston players have a pretty much clear geothermal agenda today so what's the next milestone that we'll know whether this is going to work might work not going to work uh, etc are there pilots that are happening now that we can expect results from or is it all still in the R&D stage or where are we at? Depends on again I mean as I just said there's like 20 or 30 companies and they're all in different stages of course uh, Fairbo the one I just mentioned is definitely in a piloting stage yeah? and their EGS systems also will en en enable a very large amount of geothermal or already yeah? they're definitely in a, in a stage where they're becoming commercial projects now Others, uh, I think uh, Sage was just doing some field tests and it depends on, uh, on on what technology. Some are earlier, some are later. But yeah, they're in all stages and some are definitely have near term applications yeah, where we say in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be seeing first commercial projects coming out of it. And some things like the millimeter wave technology probably has a few more years of work to be done before it can be commercialized. But like I mentioned earlier, we're a climate investor. We don't invest in stuff that comes uh, alive in the year 2040 so all of the things we look at and all the, and geothermal generally all of the companies we see is stuff that we start that we by the end of the decade are in implementation modes for all of these technologies yeah otherwise it, it has no climate impact let's for the moment assume that deep geothermal works to some um, small to intermediate extent at a, at a minimum what problems does that solve for us and how our global economic system. First of all, it's a real energy transition. I mentioned early on, this is actually a way by, and you can actually even go in and retrofit existing fossil fire, mainly coal plants. They use the same turbine eventually, um, steam turbine. You could go in and, and so-called retrofit a coal-fired power plant and you could drill a well next to it and simply exchange away the heat is being created in this power plant. So that's a real transition yeah, where we say, okay, we can take offline coal and replace it with geothermal. Now, now it's not an addition. It's a real transition. And of course, then once you've done that, and it, uh, there's also the, the case for heat to be made. This is for electricity, of course. That, and that for sure, the first case will be heat, yeah? where we where we use district heating systems, which are available with, with plenty of all over the world. Also, actually, by the way, district cooling systems, which are also becoming a thing now, specifically in sort of hotter regions, and replace the current fossil heat source with geothermal heat source this is you for that you don't even have to go that deep yeah you know, we don't need 400 degrees in a district heating no node uh, 150 is totally sufficient so that's where you can very simply use existing resources a heating uh, grid and replace this with a geothermal resource and th this already exists by the way today i mean for example the city of munich in germany is completely geothermal heated uh, with the district heating system they have low resources and uh, uh, sort of where they can easily tap into some geothermal and they, they've been using it for decades. Huh? So this is this is not a crazy future. The question is just why can't I do this in Chicago today? Yeah? Because I simply haven't found a way to, I'm not in Munich, I, I, I need to drill deeper. I can't access that heat yet. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of infrastructure that can be utilized and, and can be leveraged in order to, uh, to sort of roll it out. So that's where it will take us. And I said it's a real transition of existing um, uh, hydrocarbon-based energy. So the other point you mentioned to me is if this works, you could pretty much drill 
anywhere in Kenya, in Indonesia, in Japan, you know, in Syria, in Russia, in the United States, in Europe. So there is sort of a global South has access to affordable energy in this way that currently they don't. There's, there's that side of the story. Yes. Absolutely. It's a, we call it a very democratic, fair, distributed energy. Everybody has more or less the same access, specifically when we talk about sort of having a linear cost and drilling, when drilling is no longer a, a, a prohibition, cost prohibition for, for realizing a project. Yes, then it's, it's fairly distributed. Everybody has access to it. That is pretty much similar price because the, the, the cost difference will be marginal. It doesn't matter if you go eight or 10 kilometers. It's not going to be a make or break. But we don't have any idea about the cost yet because it's there's not even viable pilots or, or do we have some ideas? Obviously, you wouldn't be investing in it if you didn't think it was too... <laughs> exactly. No, no, we, we clearly do. Um, we, we understand the basic economics of it today already. I mean, we know the inputs. We know what these inputs cost. Um, all of these drilling technologies today are sort of called contactless drilling technologies, meaning they actually have no wear and tear on the, on the equipment itself uh, because they're not in direct contact with the rock at all. Um, so they're, they're, they're spitting some type of flame or wave or whatever, whatever the technology is out. Actually, there's no friction with, with, with the rock, right? So th therefore, we can very easily understand what the inputs are so we have to we have costs on on obviously creating the tools we have costs of powering these tools but that's actually they don't require a lot of energy it's a typically mobile 500 kilowatt generator can drill a well for 10 kilometers so the energy consumption for drilling is is neglectable and then you have so costs for removing the fluids and the muds yeah which are pumps essentially that you need to install and there there, there are certain costs for that involved as well but it's not that it, it sounds like it's 10 kilometers is so crazy and and, and long but It'll it'll take it. Any of these technologies that are being developed today, it'll take roughly ten days, fifteen days to drill such a well. You know, it's it's not that it, it's a major undertaking, and uh, the cost of this will be in the two digit millions. It's not going to per e for each of for, for each well. You know? Then of course you have the subsurf the the, the the subsurface cost, then you have on surface cost, and that depends. Am I feeding into an existing node for district heating? Am I doing a greenfield operation and building a new power station? That can completely vary, right? Depending on what you're doing on surface. So let me understand this just from a, let's assume the technology works. And I've looked at enough alternative energy things in the last 20 years to know that there, there are always complex things that we don't imagine ahead of time. But for now, I'm just going to assume that, that this is going to work. Yeah. Doesn't this also, especially if it's inexpensive, allow us to create low carbon precursors to what we've previously used fossil hydrocarbons for plastics, petrochemicals, all, all those things, because we could use the excess energy and apply it via hydrolysis or other things to, to create lots of chemical precursors. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are already investors in technologies for this. The existing, their 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 existing technologies. As a, one of the companies we invested in is called Neratech, that basically recreates on surface of fissure troughs synthesis, which means creating out of hydrogen and carbon hydrocarbons. But instead of sinking slowly to the ground with heat and pressure, create the hydrocarbons because it's the same thing. It happened naturally a little deeper yeah they are able to do this on surface in a, in a, in a containerized solution reactor and this is an old process visual drops it was invented in the name you can hear it is very german right um was invented by in, in the german cesarean time so a long time ago <laughs> uh, in the beginning of the 20th century so the, the technology is not new it's been employed as well in the oil and gas industry for for a long time uh, typically very large scale um, uh, projects but anyway so this there is technology and with that you create hydrocarbons and you can create any hydrocarbon from it you can create the, the, uh, a fuel and they're working right now on jet fuels because that's sort of a logical market but you can also create waxes i think as a matter of today they they i saw the news early on they put online today a plant in hamburg which is creating waxes specialized waxes but carbon free i mean uh, i mean not, not carbon free they have carbon obviously but circular carbon only right so they're using in this case they're using co2 from a chimney and hydrogen green hydrogen so we have the technology to create low carbon hydrocarbons as it were 
right now. No. The, the issue circular is circular hydrocarbons, that, I would call them. Circular yeah. hydrocarbons, right. The reason we don't do it and we don't do it at scale is because our, our real hydrocarbons that we're extracting from the ground are much cheaper than the you know multi-step process to create the circular hydrocarbons. But if we either had a society Absolutely. that had a different pricing system or we had exactly. depleted hydrocarbons that we didn't have as much access to, then all of a sudden these higher cost circular hydrocarbons would make more sense for society. Society might be smaller, might be less complex, but the technology exists to create all these things that we use today without accessing the 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 bounty that we've got from the carbon pulse so far yes yes the technology exists already today and the the, the reason why it's economically complex still today is because the inputs are complex to get by. We need to get carbon in a circular manner, meaning we have to take it from a chimney or from direct air capturing, which is extremely expensive still. And we need to have green hydrogen. It only matters with green hydrogen. With gray hydrogen, there's no point doing it, right? So green hydrogen is also scarce to come by. Can you explain to our listeners what, what is green hydrogen? Green hydrogen is referred to hydrogen that comes from a renewable source. Hydrogen is generally created with electricity, electrolysis. We split in water, H2O, into O and H2. Oxygen, we typically um, well use it, use it where we can or it just um, goes in the atmosphere. And the H2 we try to separate and then use for whatever industrial process. And uh, that's how we create hydrogen today. Yeah? The input for this electrolysis is energy, electricity, essentially. Um, and of course, if the uh, source of this electricity is fossil, then, you know, it's not, doesn't really make sense to create, oh, well, that's what we should do today. I mean, all, most of the hydrogen we use today is so-called gray hydrogen we use from fossil. There's all different shades of hydrogen nowadays, turquoise and whatever, with their sort of intermediate solutions. Um, green hydrogen is A, quite scarce. Uh, there's not that many projects that are able to produce green hydrogen and B, uh, uh, quite a few times more expensive, up to an order of magnitude more expensive than gray hydrogen today. But yeah, from gray hydrogen, it wouldn't have a circular effect. Yeah? It's, it's, a, it's even negative. You are, hydrogen in generally is a, is a negative energy source of a, for each joule of hydrogen I'm producing. I actually need to put whatever, 1.1 joules of any other energy source into it. And hydrogen also often is confused. People think it's an energy source. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's just a carrier, right? Of energy. Um, so we create hydrogen as a carrier. Yeah. And there's a there's an energy penalty from, from doing that. But if you had lots of yeah. very inexpensive energy, like example, getting the heat from under the earth at a low cost, then you could do yeah. that at right. So what is the main advantage? It's something we didn't touch about, Nate, also yet. And the cost of it as well. I mean, cost is, is a very important factor. And when we, wherever we look into investing into something, we want to make sure that the potential for the company is there to uh, what we call the green premium gets uh, reduced or uh, well, well it's got to come below the fossil price eventually anything that will be at fossil prices or above fossil prices is subsidies business forever and unlikely to really scale so unlikely to become a gigacorn because uh, the scale is, is so so huge um, so any technology that we look at, at must have the potential to become big Below, significantly below the price of the fossil version. For geothermal, there's a very clear pathway to that happening. You know, geothermal is already in some parts of the world significantly below Iceland, we just mentioned early on. And uh, supercritical geothermal would, would take it to the extreme. You know? It would be extremely price competitive. So other than the potential cost savings, which is pretty compelling on its own uh, if that if that manifests what are the other main advantages of deep geothermal relative to like solar and wind for example usual ones it, it's a fact that it's so called base load it's 24/7 there is no night for geothermal and no windless time for geothermal so it, it works 24 mm -hmm. 7 it's a very dense energy source as well the, the the amount of square meters you need to extract it compared to uh, solar which needs a lot of space is, is minimal yeah the wells that you drill are 
whatever, nine inch or something or 10 inch, like fairly small and provide quite a lot of um, power. So it's extremely dense. Nuclear is also extremely dense to be fair, but mm -hmm. so is geothermal. It's, uh, it's, it's stable. It's also so-called distributed. You can have it in many different places. Yeah, You don't have to have central large scale uh, plants that produce it. You can have a lot of small distributed plants. Today, I would add another point to it. It's a very secure form of energy. It cannot be easily taken out by a bomb or something, something else like it. Yeah, our, our nuclear power stations are, as we learn right now in Russia, um, uh, targets of in, in a war. Uh, um, it's basically not possible. Or more, I think more um, interesting was the vulnerability of the Saudi infrastructure. We saw, you know, this these couple cheap drones that destroyed a refinery in Saudi Arabia like a few years ago. That's a really vulnerable structure. Obviously, very low cost tools can create large damage and supply problems. None of so that's also an element that today I would add to the mix. It's a very secure infrastructure. So Sebastian, you're the first person advocating a particular technology or investing in a particular technology that I've had on this show. It's not that I am advocating deep geothermal or that even I'm a believer in it. I'm trying to be agnostic on what I want to see happening, and I'm trying to describe what is happening. And in mm -hmm. your description of what deep geothermal could do for us, I think it highlights kind of our opportunities and constraints. And additionally, I kind of like you as a human being and you're very smart and articulate. So I'm, I'm keen to learn uh, about this. So just as an aside, I'm not like advocating this, but it just seems like this potentially could be the next can to kick, you know, technologically. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but if it does work, what new problems would it create? Have, I, I assume you've thought about that. We have thought about that. It's also a question that comes quite often when we speak to politicians or others about it. So what, what other problems can we create? Honestly, it's a bit of the staggering part. We haven't found any major problems. I mean, the issue of, of sort of earthquakes or instabilities mm -hmm. comes up uh, quite often. But actually, when you look at a little bit too deeper, you find that the that's a minor issue. Earthquakes happen today in geothermal areas, mainly because we drill in generally tectonically active areas, yeah, volcanoes, faults, and so on, um, that are instable already before we drill in there and drilling enhances this instability when we are looking into deep geothermal and to new drilling technologies uh, we no longer need to drill in tectonically sensitive areas we would actually drill in the middle of the plate uh, and hence you significantly reduce those type of risks other question that asked quite is being asked quite often don't we cool off the earth yeah um, isn't that, are we going to deplete that resource as well here the answer is also i mean i mentioned earlier it's largest battery it's gigantic uh, it's continuously renewable it's a renewable source of energy so that risk is also not given sort of on a so those are the two main concerns that we are hearing quite often and we think they're quite well mitigated with the current technologies from an ecological perspective though climate change is not our problem uh, it's a symptom of over overshoot yes. as a as a species so this will not solve overshoot but i don't know what will and this seems to be the way that clever hominids will try to kick the can again and i can see some benefits from it but i can also see that if this were to work globally it would um, fuel another round of human consumption and other species and other non-climate limiters and the planetary boundaries would potentially suffer uh, potentially, yes. I mean, that's for sure that, that that's a cert certain um, on a meta level, same would happen to fusion, to nuclear or whatever. Um, whenever we mm -hmm. sort of start supplying a lot of energy, there's also maybe on, on the contrary side, uh, believe that if we are able to uh, provide energy and energy brings prosperity, prosperity brings education, you know, we might also solve the problem another way. You know, smarter people will take care more of their habitat and, and understand the global issues better. I mean, this is where I, I'm trying to be a, a facilitator here. 
in that yeah. people say, oh, we have to solve everything with this one thing. But I think there are multiple things that need to be solved. We talked about it earlier. There needs Absolutely. to be better, better governance, yeah. better education, yeah. a change in consciousness of who we are, where we came from, what we're doing, how to use energy to get healthy, better lives that aren't addicted and polarized and entitled. But that that's not your job. <laughs> your job is to look at the technologies no. of what might might happen. You know, so I, I I wish you well on on this. And I mean, Nate, this was the really interesting part of meeting you and having the conversation with you that that you obviously having this all encompassing view and you're taking care of the big picture. And it's really important that we do not take the, take the big picture out of sight. Like I mentioned, we cannot have a tunnel view on on on, on certain only one technology or that there is no silver bullet. We have to be very clear about this, and we need to do a lot of things in parallel and this is just one step of decarbonizing and and decarbonizing one of our largest problems um, and by the way so we were not only doing geothermal now fund as well we also believe in other technologies like i mentioned hydro is interesting we're looking at many hydro cases we are investors in biomass as well so biomass has more potential than we currently see so there there is not just one solution so and and again the climate is is, is a large puzzle and, and not all pieces of the same size but in order to finish the puzzle or to get a chance at doing something, we need to find all the pieces and put them together. So it's it's really it's really not about the silver bullet or anything like that. And I mentioned earlier on biodiversity is something we haven't touched on, but biodiversity is is is, is insanely important and is not measured only at least in CO two uh, and um, and education. I think we mentioned that early on as well. But you mentioned also governance. I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to <laughs> process in time. And I'm glad that somebody's out there thinking about it because, as you said, we're not proposing that we have uh, have the ultimate solution. We're adding one piece to the puzzle, technology to decarbonize. If you don't mind, I, I will close with some questions that I ask all my guests a little bit more on the personal nature. So do you have suggestions on how people living in advanced economies, perhaps uh, in Germany, can you know take all this on board and prepare themselves and their communities and their cities for kind of this economic energy transition that I call the great simplification. How do we meet the future halfway? Do you have any ideas on what to recommend to people? It's a good question and not an easy one. I mean, first of all, I think uh, again from energy blind become energy aware. Uh, become aware that it's a scarce resource, become aware that it's not just a given thing and that there's a huge cost to it as well, uh, an external cost. So I think that's, that's some, something everybody in his personal mindset can do. It costs you nothing. Uh, uh, actually, I would recommend the videos on your website, to be honest, to, to watch them. They're very easy to understand and then everybody can can invest those 20 minutes or something uh, to, to understand the problem. Yeah. So that that's the really one thing. And then if we are living in a democracy, then of course that's the power you have. You have a power to vote for the people to to make changes and uh, use that power. Go vote uh, and and vote for people who you believe at least <laughs> represent the best interest. So and of course you also have a have a choice with your if if you have any capital you have a choice with your capital how do you allocate your capital where do you allocate your capital make sure it's it has some type of long term use um, and and some type of uh, is part of the solution yeah and not part of the problem so uh, that's actually for those who have significant significant capital and often it's a combination too you think I don't have any capital but you're probably going to be part of some pension fund that um, has a lot of capital so you can also um, use your influence there yeah? maybe as an individual is tough but you can get organized and we've seen many great initiatives how how simple citizens took actions on exactly those type of institutional players so there is ways to take action political action capital action and on your own awareness and once you start becoming aware you will also start rethinking many things that you do. And what about recommendations for young people, young humans who are becoming aware of 
climate change during their lives and that were midway through the carbon pulse and some of these biophysical constraints. You were a few minutes late for for this call because you were reading a story to your four-year-old daughter. What do we tell our teenage, college age or, or younger kids uh, about the future that's going to be different than the last 50 years? I mean, first of all, what I would recommend everybody to do is to also to understand the problem, to work on a solution for the problem. And part of the solutions are, I mean, uh, in order to become part of the solution, uh, it's good to understand your science. So if, if, if you can go in that direction and, and, and be part of the solution, understanding the science, uh, study the right type of subjects, yeah, show interest. And not everybody has to become a scientist either, but you can also become a teacher, frankly. It's also extremely uh, important or, or like an educator in any sense. But yeah, create awareness and, and try to be part of the solution. All, I mean, we can so many, you can also become a content producer um, and, and create awareness. Yeah? So there, there's, there's many ways for young people to, to engage in this. That's the thing that makes me slightly hopeful and also now in a capitalistic world. Oh, what I, I often get asked, so why, why now? Why is climate change now an issue? We've known this for 30 years. Why is it actually becoming now actionable? Why are people investing into this now? The simple answer here is the people who are now the asset managers and the, and the decision makers and policy makers are of a generation that has actually grown up with the problem, you know, and, and uh, slowly starts to understand it. And the previous generation kind of denied it a little bit. Now, the, this generation that's now as allocating the assets, making the policies, they've grown up with sort of annual COP conferences starting in Rio in 92 or something and, and sort of heard that climate change is a fact. We had to take 20 years to stop the people denying it. That's kind of over now. Most most people understand that, it, that it's actually real. And now we start seeing you know, people allocating assets in this direction. It's partially that, and it's partially we see what's happening in Pakistan and in Europe and in Australia, and, and these things are kind of hard to deny. Yeah, yeah. There's all exactly we're starting to see effects much earlier than we thought we would as well. But yeah, we also are starting to see real effects that are undeniable. Yeah, fully with you. So what do you care most about in the world, Sebastian? <laughs> of course, I mean, uh, care about, uh, you know, what I, what I would really like to, uh, to achieve is to leave the next generation a place which is not a lot worse than what we found it. And that's a hard thing at the moment. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good from our wealth perspective, from our environmental perspective, from our political perspective. It seems we are, we're on a way to leave a mess behind. Um, so if I can play a role in slightly improving the situation a little bit, that would, uh, that would satisfy my sort of personal side of it quite well. So we've talked about climate and CO2, but of all the issues in the world, what are you personally most concerned about in the next 10 years or so? Yeah, that we reach tipping points that we can no longer, that just not reversible tipping points. And at that stage, we will have to move from mitigation to serious adaptation. Yeah. And in contrast, are there things that you've experienced or things that you're seeing that give you a lot of hope uh, about the next 10 years? And what would those be? Clearly, I'm in this privileged position right now that every day I'm being confronted with solutions. Um, I have a wealth of people that come to us every day with great solutions and great ideas and minds thinking about it. And this completely makes me hopeful. Otherwise, I couldn't, couldn't be doing the job. You know, I mean, it's quite frankly, you have to be slightly looking through the world with an optimistic lens in order to, to appreciate the uh, innovativeness uh, of the people. And it is amazing. People are super inventive and not all of them will pan out all of these ideas years but you know we also just need to be realistic we will need to see a ton of companies fail in this space too in order to make sure that a few could survive so from that point of view of course i'm very privileged to see a lot of people very smart people um, working on solutions and you know we are now technology investors but we see also so many non-tech solutions yeah um on a daily basis we're confronted with them um, that are also fantastic yeah and so yeah the the human ingenuity is is something beautiful yeah and that what makes us stand out as a species so in in contrast to an investor perspective uh this final question might be a little bit Odd, but if you, Sebastian, were a benevolent dictator and there was no personal recourse to your actions, what one thing would you do or implement to improve human and planetary futures? 
One thing, yeah. Or two things or three. Yeah. One thing is t- hard to grasp and if it would be a, it would be really on a dictatorship, I would probably actually go for education, ensuring that uh, everybody on this planet goes to school. Okay. The processing power that can come from there is amazing. And that we teach ecology in the school. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I should have qualified that. Yeah, not just to any school, <laughs> clearly. Uh, and, uh, yes, obviously, it goes, it goes to where we te- a school where we teach um, ecology and ethics and, and other important subjects. But yes, of course, but even like basic even basic education goes a long way already. Of course, uh, we'll have our, uh, in, in the westernized world, we'll, we'll go further maybe, but uh, even basic school in certain areas would really help. And I guess if we could force that to happen, we'd see, we would solve a lot of these overshoot problems that are, you, you mentioned earlier, it's a symptom. If we can change the root problem, you know, we'll, the symptoms will also get less. That's where I think the probably the main leverage is on education. That's also very complicated, but you know I'm a dictator now, and I'm just going to tell everybody to do it. This has been great. Thank you for taking. You had a full day at work, and then you took care of your your daughter, and and now it's past ten o'clock uh, German time. And thank you. This has been a wide ranging, informative conversation. I am sure that we will stay in touch and to be continued. Are there any other closing thoughts, uh, advice, wisdom for people listening today? Uh, no, I'd like to thank you for the very sort of comprehensive way that you put together the stuff that you do and bringing the message across thinking with this sort of holistic lens. Keep on doing that. And uh, I hope that people start listening um, more and more. I think you have some audience already, but uh, more and more to you. And let's stay in touch and uh, discuss the progress. We're still at the beginning. Danke schön, Sebastian. Guten Abend, my friend. Guten Abend. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases.